Hello again, we're into Unit 6. This will be the last unit in Chapter 1, and Unit 7 will be moving, moving on to Chapter 2. But here we're continuing to consolidate our understanding of the derivation system and the symbolization system. And uh, in this unit, I'm going to introduce a few new concepts, but nothing as large as the derivation and symbolization system were. So, uh, in this video, I'll start talking about the theorems. So, what's a theorem? Well, so a theorem is a sentence that's true no matter how its non-logical vocabulary is interpreted. So consider the sentence, if the sun explodes, then the sun explodes. This sentence is true. It's true no matter what. And also it's true given its actual meaning. It's true no matter what. But also if we take the, the sentence, the sun explodes, whatever meaning we give to it, and we give it a meaning, the con this conditional will be true. So no matter how the non-logical vocabulary is interpreted, that sentence is true. Now, since it's true no matter what, we should be able to derive it without relying on any particular premises. There are no claims, there's no further specific claims we need to derive it from. We should be able to get to it without any specific claims. And indeed, we can. We can derive this without any premises. And we're going to use that fact as our official definition of a theorem. A theorem is a, is uh, some, a sentence is a theorem if it's the conclusion of an argument that is, first of all, derivable, and secondly, derivable with no premises. So, for example, the sentence, if P then P, is a theorem because the argument, therefore, if P then P, no, no premises, is derivable. We can do a derivation of it. So, theorem 1 is if P then P. Theorem 13 is if P then Q, then if not Q, then not P. Theorem 23 says that if P, uh, P then Q only if P, then P. And theorem 18, which we've seen before, tells us if not P, if not P then if P, then Q. Theorem 2 tells us if Q, then if P, then Q. Theorem 21 tells us if not, if P, then Q, then P. And theorem 22 tells us if not, if P, then Q, then not Q. So, I'm going to talk about a number of features that theorems have building up to an important one. We're going to start with the fact that their derivations are portable. So let's just look at this derivation of uh, if Q, then if P, then Q. So we start by saying show if Q, then if P, then Q. Line 2, we assume the antecedent Q. Line 3, we say show if P, then Q. Line 4, we copy down, we repeat line 2, uh, which is Q. Well, line Q is the consequent of line 3, so we can say for CD, which lets us box and cancel line 3. So we have 3 box and cancel. Having 3 box and cancel, we can cite it for CD boxing and canceling line 1, because line 3 is the consequent of line 1. So this derivation, it's self-contained in that you could do it as a sub-derivation inside another derivation, inside any other derivation, in fact. So why is this? Well, we could write down the first show line anywhere we wanted, because it's a show line and it needs no justification. Having written it down, line 2 is assume CD. It's justified because of, of that previous show line, so that would be fine. Line 3 is another show line that we can write down wherever we want. Line 4 is a repetition of, of the line, of the assumption line, which, if it's inside of another derivation, wouldn't be line 2. It'd be some other number, but it'd still be a line, and that would be fine. We could repeat it. And then both of the CDs would be okay. So the point is that the derivation of a theorem, because it, it doesn't refer to anything outside of itself, and in particular, because it doesn't have any premises, it doesn't refer to anything outside itself. And that means that you can take that derivation of the theorem and put it inside of any other derivation you want. So, uh, and it's not just a feature of this derivation. It's a feature of the derivation of any theorem. Every theorem is portable because every theorem the derivation of every theorem is portable because the theorem has no premises and therefore the derivation doesn't refer to anything outside of itself. All line references are to lines that occur beneath the initial show line, as we see here, right? So uh, line 2 isn't, doesn't have a line reference, but it's an assumption based off the previous show line. The third line is a show line, and then the other three lines refer to lines inside beneath that initial show line. So we could take this derivation and do it wherever we want. So that's the first feature of a theorem. If you have a derivation of a theorem, you can do that derivation wherever you want. So that's nice. Uh, 
it, but it's not just that the derivation. If if we so say we know that we know if q then if p then q is a theorem, so we know that we can derive that sentence inside of any derivation. But in fact, we can we can derive any instance of the of that theorem. So we can derive any instance of if q then if p then q inside anywhere else. Well, what does that mean? What's an instance? Hmm. Well, let's talk about that then. Okay, so the conditional if r then s, then if not z, then if r then s is an instance of if q, then if p, then q. What's going on? Why is that? So we have the sentence, say, if q, then if p, then q, in which p and q are, as in this case, the only sentence letters. So we can come up with a substitution scheme for this sentence, and it takes each sentence letter in the initial inside of circle, in this case, if q, then if p, then q, and pairs it with some other sentence. So in this case, p is paired with not z, and q is paired with if r, then s. And then if we take our initial sentence, and following the substitution scheme, replace sentence letters in the, in the initial sentence with the sentences specified by the substitution scheme, then we get a new sentence. And that new sentence is an instance of the old sentence. So why if r then s, then not z, then if r then s is an instance of if q then, if p then q, because we have this scheme that says, okay, replace all the q's with if r then s, and replace all the p's with not z, and that's how you, that's a way of getting, of, of um, when you do that replacement, what results is this bigger conditional, and that's just what it means for the bigger conditional to be an instance of the initial conditional. It's that you have a sentence in a substitution scheme, and when you follow the substitution scheme on the initial sentence, what you get is the other sentence, and then that other sentence is an instance. So, but that, we can think about substitutability throughout a derivation. So, Consider, when we go back to this derivation, that all that matters in this derivation is that the p's and the q's match. So all that matters, it doesn't matter that we're actually talking using q's and using p's and q's here. It matters that what I have on line 2 is the antecedent of line 1, that what I have on line 3 is the consequent of line 1, and that what I have on line 4, and hence on line 2, and hence on line 1, is on the one hand the antecedent of line 1, and on the other hand the consequent of line 3. That's why this works. It doesn't matter that it's Q's or P's. And so we could substitute whatever we liked for Q as long as we substituted throughout the whole thing and the derivation, and we, then we would get a new derivation. So that's what we can do with our new conditional. If R then S, then if not Z, then if R then S. So see here, we've, uh, in this case, we've taken all of the... Um, the q's and replace them with r than s and all the p's and replace them with r than s and what happens what's the result well, what we have is a new derivation yes right this is the result of doing that this these replacements and so it's a uniform substitution of uh, if r than s for q and if not z then p and we get a derivation of the new sentence. So it's not just that we can say, oh, here's my new one sentence, and I can get another, I can get an instance of that sentence by doing the replacement. But also, if I say, oh, here I have a derivation of this sentence, then if I do all the substitutions throughout the derivation, then I get a derivation of the new sentence. And the justifications don't change. So the new thing is, again, a derivation. And just like the old one, it's going to be portable. You can this derivation too, you could take and put wherever you like inside of any derivation that you wanted. So let's review what we have, what we know then about theorems and instances. So suppose we have a theorem circle, and it's a theorem, so it's derivable from no premises. Suppose also that square is an instance of circle, so you get, if you take circle and you replace sentence letters by the same different sentences, you get box or square. So, and if you start with a derivation of circle, and you produce a new derivation following the substitution scheme, then you're going to have a derivation of square, and it's going to have exactly the same justifications as the initial derivation of circle. So what this means is that 
every instance of a theorem is itself a theorem because the you start with the the theorem and its derivation the initial theorem and the derivation you do the uniform replacement and you have a new derivation of the new sentence and the new derivation doesn't involve any premises so you have a new theorem so what this means is that if we if we show that one thing is a theorem like if q then if p then q, suppose we show that if q then if p then q is a theorem we that means we know that also if r then s then if not z then if r then s and any other instance of if p then q can be derived inside of any derivation as well and as i'll discuss in the next uh, video this is a very helpful fact once you've derived one theorem you know that all sorts of instances of it are derivable anywhere else and so we'll see why that might be important and how that can be important in the next video